Welcome and thank you for standing by. Today's call is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. I'd like to inform all participants you will be in a listen-only mode throughout the conference until the question and answer session at the end. I would now like to turn today's call over to Mr. Brian Beam. Thank you, sir. You may begin. Hi there. Uh, this is actually John Kim, and, and I'm really happy to welcome you all to our webinar. Uh, we'll give it a couple more minutes uh, for everyone to join us today. Um, but, uh, yeah, we, I guess we'll start uh, in about 102, let's say that. No, why don't we just go ahead? <laughs> Thank you so much for that introduction, operator. On behalf of the U.S. Commercial Service, the Connecticut, New Jersey, North Texas District S4 Consuls, and Global Growth Strategies, we welcome all of you today to today's webinar entitled Export Documentation Basics. My name is John Kim, and I am an International Trade Specialist with the U.S. Commercial Service. I'm your host for today's webinar. Joining us are my colleagues, Anthony Sargis, who resides in our Connecticut office, and Brian Beams, who is in our New Jersey office. A couple of items um, I'll discuss prior to beginning our webinar. First, be sure you are connected using both your telephone and the online WebEx platform. All telephone lines are currently on mute. We will open up the lines up for questions at the end of this presentation, and we will also take questions submitted through the Q&A feature on the WebEx platform. All attendees will receive a survey from the UCSC. Please complete this short request. Um, we ask you that uh, because they help us develop future programming for your U.S. businesses. Um, again, and Anthony will send a summary email out tomorrow that will have this webinar recording and the slide deck, so you'll be able to access this later. Um, and lastly, our web address has changed. Please note that all U.S. commercial service information can now be found on www.trade.gov. Again, that is www.trade.gov. I now like to take a minute to inform our audience about the U.S. Commercial Service. We are the trade and investment arm of the U.S. Federal Government, a division of the International Trade Administration. Our mission is to promote U.S. exports, protect U.S. commercial interests abroad, and facilitate foreign direct investment into the United States. We have a global reach. Our domestic field has over 100 offices, Internationally, our offices are located within the U.S. embassies and consulates in over 70 countries. Can go to the next slide, please. Here is the list of our upcoming webinars for this series. Um, I'll give you uh, a little bit, little bit of time so that you can write these down. Okay, hopefully that I've given you enough time. <laughs> um, I would like to now introduce today's speaker, uh, Kristen Murnau with Mohawk Global Trade Advisors. Kristen Murnau is a licensed customs broker and certified customs specialist who has worked in international trade compliance and logistics for nearly three decades throughout the New England region. Prior to joining Mohawk, Kristen worked for Microsemi FTD in Beverly, Massachusetts, as a senior manager of global logistics and compliance, where she managed licensing of EAR and ITAR commodities and shipping activities. Her experience at manufacturers has given her the opportunity to create and manage import and export compliance, CCPAT, and training programs while being part of the supply chain and customer operations. Kristen's duties include import and export gap analysis, compliance manual development, product classification, DOC and DOS licensing assistance and training. So without further ado, I welcome Kristen. Thank you very much. And also joining me today, we have Jim Trubitz, also from Mohawk Global, who's one of our vice presidents. And Jim, if you want to give a quick introduction on yourself, and we'll jump right into the first slide. Sounds good, Kristen. Welcome, everyone. Um, you know, when it comes to um, export documentation, Krista and I have worked with many, many exporters and importers on making sure their documentation is correct. 
Um, I'd hate to tell you how many years I've been doing this, but I am a licensed broker and um, and uh, and uh, uh, certified global business professional through NASBITE. But Kristen, I agree with you. You know, when it comes to documentation, the most important thing is that your shipment rides on paper. So um, there is a direct correlation between poorly prepared docs and additional costs, delays, fines, and, and possibly even a damaged sales relationship. So everybody has a, a role to play to make sure that the documents are correct when they're they're sending a shipment out. Um, well, you know, well, today, to, yeah. And, and, and Kristen, that so that. sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, no. No, no, it's sorry. Right. I was going to say that, you know, you and I today, we're going to kind of go through those, what, the most common documents and the best practices. You know, and to Jim's point that, yes, uh, your commercial documentation is a representation of your transaction. It is your shipment on paper. A great way that I like to think of it and explain it to people is that your documentation is telling a story. It's going to tell a story about this shipment about the intents of the transaction, who's responsible, so on and so forth, as well as being able to make sure that you're facilitating appropriate clearance. So when we think about those documents telling us a story, um, for those of you in the, in the good old days of Journalism 101 and looking to understand that who, what, where. So your commercial documentation is going to be able to first of all tell who. Who are the parties to the transaction? Who is the party who has the financial interest in exporting this shipment? Who is going to be involved in the transportation of those goods? And ultimately, who is going to be the importer and or the consignee on the destination side? As we continue our story and we get past who, we're going to then focus on the what. So what is the actual item that we're shipping? And Jim and I are going to give you some great tools and tips to make sure that as you explain that information on the what, that you're doing that in the best way to make sure that you've got the most expeditious customs clearance possible. We're also going to talk about the where. The where is going to come in from a couple of different directions. The where is going to give us where the product was made. We do know that duties and taxes are assessed based on the country of origin of goods. So we're going to talk about the where. And we're also going to give information in the where that has to do with the locations to the transaction. And then, Jim, we're going to take it off onto the next three, right? Mm -hmm. the, uh, you know, these most common documents, when, when we look at this slide, I promise this is going to be the only eye chart that we look at all day. Um, I, I, I attended a, a webinar, and it must have been um, 10 years ago, and everything was an eye chart. You couldn't read anything, and it really didn't focus in on what people needed to see. But Today, we're going to look at the most common documents used to quote, get paid, to export, to import, to transport, and to receive the goods. So these are really important goods. Uh, you know, these documents are really important to execute uh, and, and allow your uh, customer to get the goods into their country and deliver. So today, you know, we will talk about those the most common ones. We will also answer any questions on some of the oddball forms which can pop up along the way. Um, and as we go through this, we'll give you some different ideas that relate to different segments as they relate to different commodities and or regulations. But the first document that we're always going to end up seeing when we're getting ready to conduct any type of transportation is going to be, in most cases, a performer invoice. So a performer invoice is meant to be used before the actual physical transaction. So a performa invoice is typically used to be a, a way to pair up with the quotation. If you've issued a quotation to your customer or a proposal, they have signed it. The performa is a way for you to get the information to the customer to discuss your payment terms. In some cases, you may be looking for a letter of credit or cash in advance. By having a well-executed performa invoice, you're going to have all the data elements which are going to set your customer up to make sure that they handle any of that type of banking transactions upfront and accurately. The other thing that it's going to do is in many countries, um, for example, a country such as Brazil or India, 
there may be, or China, there may be different import requirements for your customer. In order for them to get their import permits ahead of time, a performer invoice, being a great reflection of the upcoming physical transaction, is going to be a great way to make sure that they've got all the right information, all the key elements we're going to talk about today, introduced for both their government purposes and any type of banking purposes, as I mentioned. But it's a great introductory way to make sure that all the best bells and whistles are set up for, for a successful execution of the physical shipment, plus making sure, of course, that we get the bill paid correctly. So we can see here in the Performa Invoice that one of the key areas that we first talk about is making sure that you've got the information for the date. So taking a look and thinking that we're going to issue this Performa and we're looking for a cash in advance or a letter of credit, I'm going to give a date that should be the date in which it is generated, and I'm going to be giving my terms as far as when this expires. So quite often on any kind of, you know, um, any quotation that we're giving, whether it's about the price paid of the product or if we're quoting some freight costs in there too, we want to limit the time appropriate for that performa invoice. That way, should the variables change, it gives you an opportunity to refresh the information. Also, putting the estimated ship date helps your customer when they're looking for any permitting or letters of credit. It helps those issuing agencies to understand the timeline which is going to be associated with this shipment. If it was, for example, a letter of credit and it has, for example, 45 days from the date of shipment, this estimated ship date is going to be very key to them to make sure they set per appropriate parameters for the transaction. Some of the other key elements that you're going to see are going to be a little bit about the shipment itself. In here, we're saying to the customer as the shipper that, you know what, the terms of payment that we agreed on in that quotation are going to be cash in advance. This is your way to be able to confirm that in writing and for them to bring this document to the bank in order to conduct that cash in advance transaction. We're going to have things such as the INCO terms, and I did see on the, on the uh, schedule an upcoming session on INCO terms, and Jim and I just love to talk about INCO terms here too. In this case, we can see in our example that the INCO terms are CIP. So in the case of CIP, I'm telling somebody that there's going to be freight costs included in here. So this is going to, in the cost of my goods or in the transaction, so this is going to say that something's going to happen where the originating party is going to be coordinating the freight and handling it to, the, it to that port. Having that INCO terms there is yet one more way to confirm you and your customer are on the same page as far as what that will be. Then we have our title transfer. Many people like to um, you know, think that INCO terms represents that title transfer. And INCO terms <clears throat> is not actually representing title transfer, but it's an element to the transaction. So in this case, we're looking at when does the transfer actually occur. In some cases, it may be on the title side that it could be once payment is received. It could be once the goods are inspected. It could be once the goods are um, delivered to the port in accordance with the INCO term. It could be a number of different elements. And next in this area, we also have that transportation mode. This is very key for multiple, multiple times. You know, when we're dealing with foreign parties and sometimes there can be a language barrier. It's so important to make sure that everybody understands that mode of transportation. If somebody is expecting for you air freight and you put here ocean freight, it's a great time for them to say, no, I need those goods much sooner. For the cases where you may be dealing with the potential for an over-the-road transaction, either to Canada or Mexico, but you might use air freight. This is a great place to make sure that that's clarified, as well as if it's a small pack carrier, as opposed to being through standard air freight. This is a great way to ensure that everybody has that information up front and they understand what's going to be happening in the move. Then we also have here for you, um, at the bottom of the invoice, this is an area that Jim and I um, both hold very near to our heart, is this law and dispute resolution, resolution notification. So what this is, is a way for you to make sure as early on in the transaction that all the parties are acknowledging the terms and conditions and how any issues would be resolved if there was a need for dispute. Now, sometimes you may have in your contract or your terms and conditions a governing law clause, and that may take care of this. If you don't or you're unclear, what Jim and I like to recommend to people is that they sit down with their legal person or whoever is in charge of contracts and terms and conditions, and if they don't cover this type of verbiage to help explain where things would be resolved in the event of any kind of dispute, 
then this is some great standard language that we have found that helps to get that across to all parties and covers you in the event that there's any kind of issue down the line. Kristen, I was going to say, um, you know, obviously this law and dispute resolution, it's one of those boilerplate things that, you know, you don't hope you ever need to fall back on. You know, neither one of us are international attorneys, and so we would recommend that anybody's going to go and put something into one of their terms and conditions into a sales agreement of some sort that they they talk with an international attorney. But that being said, like I know uh, with a couple of the international attorneys I've worked with, they usually will modify this to indicate the state that they want and, and possibly the city they want to have the dispute um, resolved in. Um, I had an exporter that didn't put this into an agreement and they wound up going to Singapore seven times before they could resolve um, uh, a dispute resolution. And, and so, I mean, seven times on a plane and they had to hire an attorney in Singapore, which was not an easy thing. Um, you want to make, make, make sure you're maintaining control. So this little thing, just like we saw in the slide before with the terms and conditions, uh, you know, when does title transfer, the INCO term, all those little things that are added into that, that agreement or that contract um, will, um, you know, are binding, right? Most definitely. And, you know, to Jim's point, you know, some of the, the bigger corporations with longer history in international trade may have this type of area covered within their conditions or their contracts. But, you know, especially for those of you which may be newer to the exporting arena and, you know, looking at those initial customers and wanting to make sure you're keeping those customers happy, you still want to make sure that you're protected if something should go wrong. So this is a great, you know, once you get the copies of the slides, a great thing to bring to your legal group and be able to say to them, you know, want to make sure we're well covered. Should we run by our conditions by an international attorney? And just make sure that everybody is, you know, have that conversation openly to show that you're looking out for the best interests of the corporation. And we'll also see here on the performa, we saw that we have that this um, upcoming shipment is going under terms of CIP. And we can see here down bottom that we have itemized out the air freight. So the air freight and any other additional charges, in this case there was also the insurance and some packing charges, are being itemized out so that way it also helps to explain on the destination side the value of the goods confirmed through the body of this Performa invoice, but as well as what the anticipation is on the freight, packing, insurance, et cetera. And again, having that expiration helps you as the shipper that should the rates, and we all know with what's been going on in our, in our world for the last six, nine months, that air freight rates can change. So having that expiration date in there also protects you that if they don't get back to you, and the rates fluctuate dramatically. You've got the ability to renegotiate that with your customer. And Jim will take us to the commercial invoice. Kristen, I got a question for you still first. Uh, you know, sometimes you'll see where people actually put the freight charges and the packing costs down and the insurance cost, and sometimes they hide it in the price. You know, what's your thoughts on that? Well, you know, part of this is that it should, it should be in line with your actual INCO terms and that you need to be clear on what those costs are. So if you are including it in the cost of goods and it is in an INCO term which includes that type of um, transportation cost, is to be able to, if not in the body of the invoice, make some kind of comment that the actual pricing in either your total or your grand total is in accordance with the term. So that way it helps the party on the other side to know if for customs clearance, should they be looking for those charges or based on the way that their country handles the import, is it a non is it a non factor? Mm -hmm. I, I I've I've had uh, many uh, an exporter call me and say, should I show it in it or should I bury it in there? And, and a lot of it depends, I think, on the industry you're in as well. You know, because some people, you know, they're they're fighting and say, well. I can get, you know, the air freight for $3,079. Why should I pay you $3,179? And then there's other ones that they just hide it in the price and, and then, you know, take it or leave it. So I think it does depend on your industry and, and your how you want to approach this. Mm 
I think, as well. Uh, you know, I, I don't know your thoughts on this, Kristen, but, you know, I'd love to hear it. Well, you know, definitely. And, and we all know that in some of these cases where exporters are using their freight buying power, that they don't necessarily want to give away the full amount of what exactly they're getting for rate. So that does give the opportunity to build it in, into the cost itself. But here where it is in the performer mode, too, to Jim's point, it's also an ability to give a tactic to confirm to your customer, if I ship it in accordance with this INCO term, this is what those charges are going to look like. And maybe that is one of the areas that exactly to Jim's point gives your customer the opportunity to say, you know what, my forwarder can beat that, or you know what, I prefer you ship under the INCO term. That cost is great, and I know that you're responsible um, for that part of the transport with your freight forwarder. So, you know, it, it really does exactly, Jim, to the combination of the industry, how you're taking advantage of your buying power, the relationship with your customer, who has the kind of the best, um, the best abilities within the freight industry. So being able to put those charges there serves a purpose depending on what's going on with your actual transaction. But um, if it wasn't listed there itemized and you were using an info term such as CIP, your customer's broker could ask them either through, back through you if there is a rate associated with it, or in some countries what they'll do is take a percentage if they're backing that off of the duties and taxes. So it really depends on the country you're dealing with on how they would ultimately deal with it. Right, Jim? You got it. Thanks, Kristen. Um, when it comes to commercial invoice, come on, this is that key document. This is the, the official transaction record. It's the permanent document that replaces that pro forma. And, um, you know, so it's used to get paid. Um, it's used to arrange the export and the import of the goods. You know, so this is a really important document. Uh, so, you know, one of our, our key recommendations right off the bat is, is reviewing this commercial invoice with your freight forwarder or the customs broker in the other country or your buyer just to make sure it's completed properly. Um, you know, any errors on an invoice may result, right? Delays, penalties, seizures. So this is, this is one document that being precise is going to prevent so many issues. And, and so this is something that we want to stress over and over. You know, customs, for the most part, doesn't even examine shipments, they'll usually look at the paperwork first. If the paperwork is not complete, then they may call an exam. So this is why it's so, so important that people look at this and, and make sure they got it correct. Uh, next slide. You know, and we all know, too, that, you know, when you're having to make modifications to an invoice after the shipment is in transit, it just gives room for more confusion. So taking that time, especially if there is any odd um, payment terms or licensing or permit requirements, to send that document ahead of time and have everybody review it and confirm that all the information is accurate is only going to save you heartache and problems down the line. So uh, back to you, Jim. You got it. So the actual commercial invoice, when, when you look at this document, you know, there, there's some key areas that we want to make sure we focus on first. And, and the, the, the fields, the name and address of the seller and the buyer, this is not one time to do an abbreviation. Um, and I'm, I'm going to tell a story here at this point. Um, there was a, an exporter that had 16 containers go to Brazil. And someone in customer service uh, was having trouble getting the, the people in Brazil's full name on the the, the consignee name box completely out, so they shortened it. And when they did, it accidentally turned out to be another company uh, registered in Brazil. So um, we actually had, um, uh, we were part of the transaction where we saw the emails going back and forth, and they were saying, um, help, this, these 16 containers are snagged right now. We need replacement documents. And like Kristen, you, you said, it went back and forth. And with Brazil, right, what's one of the key things? You need originals. So they went, they corrected the name and sent it off, but 
but they didn't get the sign-off first, and the party in Brazil came back and found a couple more errors on this invoice. And so they went back and forth, and they occurred storage and demerge on 16 containers while they were trying to resolve this. So this is so important that, you know, that this invoice, that name and, and address of the ultimate consignee, and if the buyer is different, that those are correct. And, you know, if you have a PO number, make sure it's referenced there. All these items are critical for that. And no, no, I recently had someone who on one of these addresses with best of intention was abbreviating a city, um, thinking it was a state and using a two-letter code um, as if it was from the United States. So we, we also want to think, too, that when you're looking at these addresses and putting these addresses on that documentation, to make sure that you're also looking back at the customer's order. How did they list their address? Make sure that the way that you might think it is isn't, um, isn't in conflict with their document and, you know, that everything lines up correctly. The other thing, uh, Kristen, if you, if you know, it's like, look at, we, we have some of the things with the INCO terms and things like that. It's very likely between the pro forma and the commercial invoice, there will be changes. I can't tell you how many times I've seen the INCO term change or the terms of sale change. So this is something to keep in mind that, you know, um, it, it, as Kristen said, that, that that invoice is true and correct, and it reflects the reality of what's going on. So that, that's something that's really important. And then the next part of this slide, if you look at it, is you're going to see that it's going to have packages, gross weight, um, cubic meters. That this is this is more than a lot of people would see on an invoice, but. This is important, the marks and the numbers, indicating the number of packages, if there's a PO number, if there's a, you know, whatever is reflected on the actual uh, crate or cartons, it's best to have that indicated there. So in the event these goods would ever be examined, they can go out and look at it based on the invoice as well. Next slide. So when it comes to invoice descriptions, you know, Chris and I are going to talk quite a bit about this. I don't care if you're, um, you talk to a Canadian customs official, a U.S. customs official, or customs in any country. Um, they need good descriptions. Unfortunately, they don't know what an A640 is, but they wouldn't understand what a power supply is uh, based on its output and, you know, in its function. One of the things that I recommend as well is serial numbers. Or, and, and the reason I, I recommend serial numbers is how many of you um, repair items and, and possibly under warranty, if you export them under a serial, serial number, they come back and then go back out, they're going to be able to get back into that other country and into the United States for repair as well. Uh, because you have a direct correlation between the serial number and proof of export, proof of import back in, proof of export back on, out under a repair. Jim, can so I add this, to that, please? Yeah. <clears throat> that with those serial numbers, for those of you on the call who are also exporting any type of licensed goods, <clears throat> if those are coming back in the country for any type of repair or replacement, you may have clauses, conditions, or provisios on those licenses that you essentially need to be sure that you can track which specific unit is coming in and out. So aside from just your internal warranty and inventory management, that serial number may be very important to make sure that you can evidence which license that something went out on, came back in under, and then left the country again after being repaired if it had to be, for example, on a license exception or on a license exemption. So this is a great way to add to what Jim was saying to make sure that you've got that um, really tightly controlled. Exactly. 
The only thing, uh, you know, that that would go without saying too is, Kristen, if, if, you know, obviously if these things are under warranty, the more information you have on this invoice in that, that section saying goods were repaired under warranty, uh, repair costs were the following, the more information the better because there's a lot of countries that if your goods are going back under warranty repair, you only have to pay the duties if there is duties or the, the value added tax only on the repair portion. So the more specific and detail you can provide here, the better, right? Most definitely, most definitely. This is, I think, one of the, the biggest areas when we talk about um, that your documents need to tell a story is that description, you know, being the commodity itself. And if there's any specific peculiarities to the shipment, you know, whether it's a warranty repair, a temporary loaner, a free of charge gift or um, demonstration unit, whatever that case is, in that description, make sure you tell as much of the story. So, and as we actually move into telling a little bit more about um, your item description. So what we wanted to talk about here is that, you know, we know in our industries, we get used to the acronyms that we use for things. Those of us in logistics, we have tons of acronyms that we use for, for forms and terms and things like that. And it can be very easy to get uh, used to using those abbreviations. So think about it if you're a customs officer. You're seeing the shipment, and all of a sudden you look at the invoice and you look at the, the tariff number which has been provided, and you want to make sure that it makes sense, that they line up. And you've got an item description of something such as GBE1250LH. Well, for somebody who's looking at this transaction, they're going to look at this paper and say, I have no idea what a GBE is. That 1250, maybe that's got something to do with computers, not really sure. Our biggest job is to make sure that anybody who's looking at these documents, particularly from the agency perspective on export or import, can look at this description and be able to go, I know what this thing is. Or that they could, you know, they could go to the good old Google and they could put in those words and be able to see it and visualize it. So a little bit better versus that GBE was a description of uh, land slash ADP part. Now in there, I've used two acronyms. So some of your customs guys may understand what those acronyms are, some of them may not. And then there's that little word part. What do you mean by part? So I've already, with this description, I've given the customs officer the potential to ask three questions. What are each of these acronyms and what is a part? Now as we look here at a better, the best version of the description, we can see that it's an optical transceiver. Ah, okay. We can see what an optical transceiver is. We could look online and be able to understand what that is. There's probably information within the regulations which pertains to those words. And we see that it's for a LAN ADP system. Now I understand what they mean when they said that it was a part. So it's an optical transceiver that is being used within a LAN ADP system. So we do want to make sure, again, as much as possible, make sure in these descriptions, don't just stick with part numbers or SKUs or model names. And particularly those of you who may have occasionally, we, we come up with model names for our products, which are fun and very marketable. And it's nice to use those in your descriptions on your invoice. But, you know, many of us who've worked uh, particularly in the dual use of the munitions side, if you have a description that starts off with something like camo or military, and then after that, it's like something like a, a military container or a military mug. So really what you're shipping is a mug. The military might be because it has camo on it for coloring. So using that word military is going to beg that question of, is this a military item? Why are we using that? So to think very consciously about these descriptions being about the product from the tangible sake of it, as opposed to the marketing flavor, which may give a little bit more about its, its essence. We want to focus on what is that tangible item. Many industries you'll find that using the words within your industry that reflect that tariff number are going to be the key to success for the first time that you have a customer importing from you. And, you know, you guys all know your different um, product areas, so you know what those triggers are. In chemicals, for example, I would always list the CAS number if you have a CAS. So those are some of the things. If you're shipping something that's in a metal, don't just say metal. Make sure you explain that it's aluminum. 
stainless steel, carbon steel, whatever that actual model is. You know, Jim, I think you've had some interesting experiences on the machinery side with description. Exactly. Um, Kristen, for some reason I've inherited importing large machines in and exporting large machines out of the country. And, and so there's a couple important takeaways on this. And one of them is whenever you ship something that's knocked down, it's best to indicate that as part of that description. So, um, you know, I actually sent a filtration system to um, Canada a, a couple years ago. And this filtration system, it, it went across on seven trucks. So we, we actually had it as one filtration system knocked down for shipping purposes. And, um, and this, this is an important consideration. If, if you're in this type of business and it's a large project, get in touch with the importer record or their broker, you know, in that country and find out what is going to be required to make sure that these goods are cleared as one item, you know, a filtration system in this case. Uh, I've imported cranes. Uh, I brought in a cancer clinic. Um, the cancer uh, magnets and, and, and stuff like that. All this is important that you have it worked out so that description is clear and precise for customs, plus you meet the requirements so you can get those goods into the other country. That, that's a really important takeaway. Um, the other thing, Kristen, that you, you made me think of when you were talking about this is some parties, some exporters, uh, ERP systems can't really produce a, a good description. So how do you work around that? Uh, a lot of times customs will allow you to do a supplemental document and submit it with it to give that better description, to take it uh, past that point GBE 1250LH and, and put a description with it that is an optical transceiver for a LAN ADP system. Something has to be done to give more information because if you don't provide it, they could ask for it, right? Most definitely, and you know, I myself with the different um, big name ERP systems out there ran into that problem where the field is just too short and either the supplemental would work or even if your ERP system has a notes ultimate region field, which is printable to the form, that can be an area particularly like machinery, things which are going to be that you, you, want, you almost want a paragraph. You know, you want to be able to give a good explanation of what this is and that it's going to be across multiple trucks or containers or with, um, with parts to support it being able to have that good size field. So I, I often find that notes are also a good way to do that. Excellent. Okay, so we also have that when you are dealing with um, in that body of the commercial invoice area, um, on this next one we can see that we had a printed ticket board specially designed for military radar. And then we gave the part number for it along with our ECCN. And there's a field there for the license number. So if it is the case where you are going to have a licensed shipment or you are going to be using an exemption or an exception, be it ITAR or EAR, make sure that you're also listing that on the commercial invoice. Make sure you're telling that full story. If you have any interesting banking outside of standard payment terms, such as a documentary letter of credit, that letter of credit number is going to end up on that commercial invoice and typically, you're going to do that with also the date of issue. Now, whether it's you or a third party negotiating that letter of credit, before this invoice makes it into the means of transportation, make sure that you're lining it up against the letter of credit for any other type of things that you need to add to your commercial invoice. Or, you know, for those of you who've been dealing with LCs for a while, you know that we also sometimes need to make sure that the errors or the typos in the LC follow through to the documentation. So take the time to do that or send the document over to your third party or freight board or whoever it is who's going to file that negotiation and make sure that you've got everything. This would be another difficult situation to update for banking purposes once the goods are in transit. So it's a great idea to make sure that you take care of that ahead of time. <clears throat> and we can also see down here that we do have our um, country of manufacture, so very important. Duties and taxes are typically going to be assessed on a combination 
of the country of manufacture and that tariff number. The tariff number may be the one that you suggested or ultimately the customs uses, but they're going to be looking for that country of manufacture. This is also a great place, as we will in the next document, we're going to confirm that weight. So we're going to say excuse the numbers and, and um, what kind of units that we have there. If it's one piece, if it's 12 pairs, if it's half a gallon, six liters, whatever that is, this is one of those first places that in the transaction transport we want to confirm. We're also here going to be confirming that very important stuff about pricing. So pricing is the key. What is that unit price? What is that total price? And most importantly in there is that if it is not going to be in the currency of the, um, of the country in which you're exporting from, to make sure that you specially delineate that this is not in your currency. So if it's in euros or if it's in pounds sterling or krona, whatever, whatever um, currency it's in, make sure you also delineate that out. In this case, <clears throat> based on our terms and our um, setup with our customer, we're also delineating out the packaging costs, freight costs, and insurance costs. So for them and for this transaction, that is appropriate to make sure that it's properly um, assessed when it clears customs. Then we've got these most important statements, right, Jim? Mm hmm. Yes. <clears throat> so, so uh, first, yeah, yeah, go ahead, Kristen. Yeah, go ahead. So, first we have our destination control statement. And export reform a few years back, we went ahead and we updated this statement. So, here is the copy of the most updated version of the destination control statement. This is another one of those for you that. Having this statement on there is a great way to show your due diligence and your export compliance and pass on to your customer that now that they've received goods from the United States or manufactured in the United States, that they have a responsibility to adhere to U.S. law if they are going to go ahead and resell this product or transport it, transport it to a third party. So this is a great way that if you've done that due diligence on who the customer is and their end user, and for some reason it diverts or goes to a sister entity in a country that requires a license, this is one of the ways that as an exporter, you're making sure your customer knows that. You've probably been talking about it for months if it's licensed goods or if they have any kind of um, customer base in a country that's not one that the United States does business with. But this is that statement that gives you that big CYA. Um, you will also find that this, for any goods which are not EAR 99, is required. It's required for this statement to be out there. I come from the school of logic, and we'll hear what Jim thinks, but uh, I'm in the school of logic that <clears throat> get the statement out there. Even if it is EAR 99, it makes sure that that customer knows. Should they make any type of um, interest in transferring that product? Let's face it, we have customers that we do business with, who do business with countries that are embargoed or sanctioned by the United States, just the reality of our world, world economy. So having that statement there is a great way to ensure that you've passed on those requirements. Kristen, I couldn't agree more. Um, I can't tell you how many um, trade attorneys have told me over and over, having this on your invoice is good bulletproof. It's, it's you know, it's, it's boilerplate. It's solid boilerplate that people need to have on their invoice just to protect them. Um, one of the red flags that I have, I, I review people's export documents all the time, and I'll look at them, and they actually have the old destination statement still on their invoices. That's almost like a red flag saying, um, you know, we haven't really been looking at this for four years. Um, you know, uh, did it change? So that that's an important consideration. So keep in mind that it, it, this should be one of the takeaways after this um, webinar is go look at your invoice and make sure you're using the most current destination control statement on your invoice. Most definitely. And, you know, in most cases, a freight forwarder, if you're shipping through a freight forwarder, if you weren't one of those parties who came along with that update timely, would end up catching that for you. So that's something that you should also consider to be one of those areas to assess. That's practices from your freight forwarder. If they haven't brought this to your attention, that might be reason for a conversation. We have another statement here. Um, Jim, if you want to, the certification statement. Sure. Now, 
you know, I've seen it as short as saying this invoice is true and correct. Um, but it, this is an important declaration that should be on your invoice. And especially for certain countries that you're exporting to uh, have known to have um, a situation where people um, will use a double invoice or use a, an invoice for a lower amount. This invoice is basically saying this is the true and authentic invoice. And so this is the one that you want to use. And um, there, there's one thing that I, we recommend, Chris and I both do wholeheartedly, is the actual signature itself. And when it comes to a signature on an invoice, always use blue pen. Uh, and why? Certain countries like Brazil require a blue pen. Uh, so this is an important thing, because if you send the, the original documents and they're not in blue pen, they're not going to accept that invoice. And this is going to cause a delay. Uh, I had one uh, exporter ask me, well, why don't we just learn the countries that require a blue pen and then we'll only sign it for those? It's, in my opinion, it's just easier to sign everything with a blue pen for your signature and be done with it. Uh, Kristen, your thoughts? It most definitely. Blue, blue pen is going to be the easiest way for somebody to quickly be able to see that it's an original signature. Again, don't give any reason for them to look any deeper. With black, they might be looking to figure out if it's a, a copy or not. <clears throat> and as there are those countries who do require an original and or blue signature. Uh, Got to say it, Jim, because it, I've had it happen a couple times where people will put a red signature on there. We do urge you to <laughs> stay away from the red ink. Here in the United States and in many other countries, that, and that red pen belongs to the customs guy. So your best practice is to be able to stick with that blue signature. <clears throat> Jim, I've had a signature question pop up a couple times lately. Where, <clears throat> who is the right person to be signing this document? So in the case someone where you're would, exporting it, I'm sorry? I would say someone that has knowledge. So if... Exactly. Um, you know, let's face it, Kristen, if, if they call the company, um, they're going to want the person that has the knowledge about that transaction. You know, yeah, that, that's in, in my opinion. Go ahead. And if you're somebody who's using like a 3PL and the 3PL just prints out the documents and they're able to sign them, that, there's nothing wrong with that. But what you need to do is make sure that the practices are put in place and odds are that 3PL is going to want a power of attorney, and that power of attorney is going to say something to the effect of that we're signing documents on your behalf and that you as the exporter have attested to the authenticity of the information. So it's okay to have that third party do it, but you want to make sure that the person who's making that invoice generate is that one who has the information of the transaction. Now, I personally, for best business practices, I'd let a 3PL on my EAR 99 stuff go ahead and, you know, be able to sign those and get those moving. But if it was a shipment which required a license, I would go ahead and make sure somebody within the corporate entity was double-checking all of those elements because we do have the increased compliance risk where there's a license involved. And that way, too, for your 3PL, it lets them know that you're looking out for their interest and that you're kind of company who's going to make sure that anything that could be a national security commodity is 100% correct before it goes out the door. Then our next document that we're going to come across is the packing list. Thanks, now Kristen. Now, the packing list. Um, yep. Okay, go ahead. Yep. Oh, my apologies, Jim. You go right ahead. <laughs> no, no, it's all right. Um, when it comes to packing list, it's a very important document. Um, it's used to conduct customs exams on export as well as import, but it's also used to verify that the goods were properly shipped and properly received. And then, um, you know, determine the shipment weight and volume and dimensions, things like that. But more important too, and this is the one that we hope we never have to have uh, use this packing list for, and that's to make an insurance claim. It's a bad scenario, but Sometimes it happens. So if you don't have this, this packing list and you have a, you know, let's face it, if it's just one package going out, you don't really, you know, the packing list 
can be a lot simpler than if it's a whole machine going out. And um, I have a, a great story to tell on this one because there was a, an exporter that was sending machinery to the Ukraine. And shipping went and tried to load um, so many pallets into the 20-foot container and couldn't fit them all. So they grabbed that one last pallet, just threw it in the 40, and um, closed both doors. Both trucks drove away, and they they handed the their documents to the front and didn't to the customer service person to do the commercial invoice and didn't say, oh, by the way, um, we couldn't fit that one pallet into the 20, so we threw it in the 40. This shipment got to the Ukraine, and they opened it up, and there was one extra pallet in the 40 and one less in the 20, and they held the shipment for what it turned out to be about 60 days till they could resolve this issue. And there was penalties, there was storage and demurrage. And, and so what I guess my message here is just make sure that shipping and receiving is communicating uh, with the front of the house if they're doing the documents as well because we want everything to match up. You know, um, we you know we always joke, Kristen. What you know, if if there's more than one shipment extra in a in a container, we would call that an overage. Customs calls that smuggling. So you know, so they're going to think the worst before they think uh, that it was something innocent. And we were able to, you know, they were this exporter was able to explain what happened, but it took a while for even shipping to remember what happened. And so, so this was a real mess. And in the meanwhile, this customer who bought this machinery couldn't install it until it was resolved. That's a very good point, Jim, on that, you know, the guys in shipping, by the time the goods get to the destination country, they've moved so many shipments since then that they may not recollect what exactly happened or where something was. Um, I'm going to add to that that, you know, we all see at times that various um, items seem to be more likely to be looked at by customs. If you're going to be somebody who's shipping a number of different items within a shipment and boxes one through three are going to have monitors for computers and boxes six through ten are going to have CPUs or something different, make sure on these pack lists that you're able to delineate out which packages have which ones. Sometimes customers may be more interested in looking at something based on a country of origin. So they, if they can go to your packing list if they're going to look at the goods and quickly be able to line up which box or which container that product is in, it's going to be much quicker of a case of them being able to go through and do any kind of inspection that's required. You know, if you've got food that you're exporting out and there's three different foods in one shipment and you're able to say what's in each um, pallet, then that is going to make sure that once they open that to take a look at it, they can get at the right item right away. So it does work for your advantage. And then, of course, last but not least is once that gets to your customer and those guys or gals in receiving are working through receiving the product, if they come up with a discrepancy, this packing list delineating out those package numbers or pallet or crate numbers is going to be a great way for them to be able to go back and double-check the shipment before they're going back to you as the shipper with any concern. Kristen, great point. I was going to say, um, you, you nailed it. And the one thing that I've seen happen when that packing list is not precise, right? Customs has to open every single box looking for that item. And, you know, if some of these items could be damaged when they're when the boxes are open, it just puts that whole shipment more at risk, right? Most definitely. And, you know, time is money as, as far as if there's costs associated with the time that they're doing these or the time that your customer has suffered either in manufacturing or in deliverables out to the end users. So most definitely have a nice, strong packing list. Our next document here is what we call the SLI, or the Shipper's Letter of Instruction. The one we've put up here for you is the one that Mohawk Global utilizes with its customers. Pretty much every freight forwarder is going to have their own SLI. The SLIs, though, are pretty much standard with the elements that it's looking for. 
Um, I've had cases myself where I was actually able to, in ERP systems as an exporter, be able to map out with the IT team and be able to generate an SLI that provided all the data elements and it was automated. So I'm the biggest fanatic of being able to automate something wherever possible. Um, but otherwise, you're going to receive these from your freight forwarder, and they're basically looking for a lot of the same information. They're wanting you to be able to confirm all those parties to the transaction. They're going to be asking you if this is actually a related party. That's going to be one of the areas that uh, they need to file when they're doing their export processing, and they're going to ask you that question here. They're going to ask you some information as far as if there's things such as carnage coming in play if this is a routed export transaction. They're going to request other elements that were in your commercial invoice as a check and balance. Should one of those not match between the commercial invoice and SLI, you would likely receive a phone call asking you to confirm things. The SLI is also going to have in it um, your licensing information for the export. Is this an EAR shipment, EAR 99 with no license required, or is there a license number a license exemption on our ITAR side, ITAR side, excuse me, or an exception on our EAR side. So this is where you're going to be um, documenting that out to the freight forwarder and ultimately um, putting that UCCN USML code and all the other information that's pretty much accumulated from your transaction between your commercial invoice and your packing list. And then from there, you're ultimately going to be signing this document. And that's going to be one of, the, um, one of the big things that we want to think about, is that when you are signing an SLI, it is a legal document. So if this is one that you're giving to your freight forwarder, or in the case of a routed transaction, that based on um, the, terms of, the terms of the INCO terms or your arrangements with your customer, if you're providing it, once you sign that SLI, you have given them legal power of attorney over that specific shipment. So you pass the responsibility to them to file the information to the appropriate agencies electronically. And you also, as, as the exporter in that case, would want to take advantage of your responsibility to make sure that you verify the accuracy of what they submitted. Now, we all know in our AES filing that there's different thresholds of what needs to be filed and doesn't need to be filed based on the value and if there is a license or an exception included. But by signing that, they're saying I'm expecting them to do the right thing and I'm going to be requesting evidence of what they have done to make sure they've done it correctly on behalf of my tax ID number. Jim, did you want to add to that on the routed transactions? So on those routed, if it is a true routed transaction and your, your customer is working with their freight forwarder and they are doing this as the foreign principal party of interest, they should actually be the one who is ultimately providing that SLI. So it really depends on the terms of your, of your transaction. But in most cases, we find out of the U.S. that the, the SLI does end up being provided um, by the actual exporter, that U.S. party. All SLIs are going to be shipment specific. So this is not one of those type of forms where um, a blanket approach is appropriate. So each shipment, because you are attesting to the value, the dimensions, the weight, the parties to the transaction, all of the terms, including, as we saw, that you're going to be giving reference numbers for invoice numbers and purchase order numbers. Those numbers are going to make their way through the transaction, possibly be part of your banking documents, possibly part of your import permitting for your customer. So the whole way through, Having those individual reference numbers on all those shipments and possibly in your SLI too is your way of making sure that everything stays nice and tight and concise. So blankets just don't make sense for an SLI. We also have that unsigned SLIs are not valid and stand of a source of being information only. So in the case where you do have that your customer is acting as a foreign principal party of interest, Maybe they have a freight forwarder who does a lot of co-loading for them. If you're being asked to provide the information, you should not be, and they're going to be the one actually in the filing, you may be providing it unsigned in order to relay the information to that freight forwarder. The signed version should be coming from the customer. Now, I personally, if I was going to be sending something over that's unsigned to be representation of information only, 
I would put a big X through that signature area and make a notation to be provided by whoever that party is. So that way there's no room for error or for somebody to sign a document that you generated. Also, there should be no blanks. So that is one of your best practices to make sure that in each area where there's a yes or no request, give them a yes or no. You know, back to that, you know, old adage that don't give them any room to interpret and to ask any questions that you haven't laid out that information. Never give them any reason to, uh, to think twice. Um, even when it comes down to that, you know, if there's no ECCN assigned that it's EAR 99, lay out that EAR 99. Don't give any reason for confusion that maybe you forgot to fill in the field. Just go ahead and put in that EAR 99 as a best practice. One of the fields that's really, really important, and this is a newer one, Jim, in the last five, 10 years, is going to be ultimately the type of party that the ultimate consignee is. So the government is asking you to make a decision that's going to be filed that says that if this is um, a direct customer, or if this is going to be a government entity, or if this is a reseller. Now there is an option on this form to be putting other slash unknown what do you think, Jim, of putting other unknown? Did I lose, Jim? So other unknown should be one of those things which is a, a never should end up happening. Other gives the reason for somebody to stop and say, do you not have the proper due diligence on your transaction to know what kind of type this party actually is? So if you have confusion, you're the person in the logistics area who's doing this shipment, make sure you work with those customer support and or sales type of groups to make sure that you know that type of entity. You know, quite often the government entity is gonna be a tad bit obvious, but if it's a direct customer or a reseller, those of you who are using distribution models within your, um, your outbound supply, then quite often reseller may come up for you. And what that lets the government know is that this may be a transaction with a reseller, that product could end up on a shelf and ultimately could be distributed through retail channels, for example. If it is something that has any kind of control or ECCN to it, it lets the government know that this is an entity who likely already has agreements in place with either the U.S. party or the U.S. government on how to handle any subsequent licensing. But if you're looking at it and going, I'm gonna have to click that other or unknown before doing that, stop and ask those questions internally and make sure that you get the accurate information. We've also got on here our forwarding agent and yep, for this one we went ahead and put Mohawk Global Logistics for you. But this is a time where you're going to, if you're, if you're using a more generic sheet of an SLI, to make sure you confirm who that party is. That way, should it be a transaction where the customer gets involved and wants to switch freight forwarders, you've already filled in this field on who that freight forwarder should be and you've already signed it. So they can't actually be forwarding this over to somebody else. So one of those other areas for a really good best practice. We also here you can see on the SLI is gonna ask you all of that basic information about that transaction again. What was the mode? What is the named um, port of where it's going? What is your state of origin? Typically this is going to be a pull down and in that uh, state of origin is going to be our US two letter codes for each of the states. You're going to pick the ultimate destination country. This is one of those two that this may have times depending on um, certain situations where you may have a pass through country. So if you're having a pass through country, this is also going to show where it's ultimately being, um, where the cargo is ultimately going to. That information is important for the AES purposes. You might have an entry number if this was, for example, something you brought in under an ITAR exemption for repair and replacement. This could be if it was Canada, um, you might be shipping it out under 126.5, or if it was going to another country, 123.481 for your exemption or exception. If you ship an ITAR item out that had been previously imported for repair or um, replacement, that entry number is required to be kind of the closeout from that import, kind of the, the frack to the frack, the frack exact combination. Other indicators that you may have to fill out if it warrants your situation, if you are dealing with FTV, if it was an inbound move, or if you are actually dealing with an ITAR shipment with DDTC registration. 
We also hear these are your yes, no fields. So each of those areas you want to make sure that you're filling in between if there's insurance associated, if there's a TID, hazardous material, et cetera. Our description area, we want to make sure again that description, if, you, if it's best for you to be including a style or a part number, go ahead and include that. But then make sure from there that there's enough of a description that again, an officer can associate that the Schedule B number, which you put down, makes sense for the product which is going out the door. Typically, this is going to be a mirror reflection of your pack list and your commercial invoice. So all documents should pretty much carry that same description through to each other. In here, we see a great case where they've given the model number, what the product is, being a butterfly valve, and have also added in there helping out to understand that it's with titanium alloy casing. They've provided the serial number to the point that they could look at it, be able to double check and verify, as well as for that trackability should it need to come back into the country. Okay. And um, down in the lower section, we're going to end up filling in and putting in our export license number, any license exception system uh, symbol, any exemption number, or simply if the product is NLR. Again, this is one of those that even in the case of EAR 99, it's best practice to complete this field versus giving somebody the room for confusion. Particularly those of you who are on the call who do have some product with ECCN and some that are EAR 99, give that information up front so it never gives anybody reason to question. And Jim, we're off to the certificate of origin. I think I have still lost Jim. So our certificate of origin here, um, this is going to establish for us where the goods were actually manufactured. So this form which we're showing right now is more of a generic version. So this is going to be the case where somebody says to you that they need you to confirm via a form and possibly asking for it to be Chamber of Commerce stamped or just to be notar notarized that confirms the country of origin of the goods. This may be required in certain cases where it may be a certain country may require it. They may use the certificate of origin to be part of an inspection process. They may be needing this based on um, certain country of origins may have preferential reduced duty rates. And in order to be able to take advantage of that in their country, they need an additional document. Even though you've got it on the commercial invoice, the specific certificate of origin is what is best for that country. So this is a case where customers are going to require that right up front in most cases if they need it, hopefully not after the fact. Your freight forwarder can for you if necessary be able to get this stamped by the Chamber of Commerce and take care of any type of notary if that is required. Make sure when you are filling this form out of course that certificate of origin is the actual origin of the manufacturer of the goods, not the physical origin of the goods. So this is that major differentiator that, you know, in the case here, we do have that um, these goods are coming from ABC Corporation in Michigan. And it looks like these ones specifically are all set for being U.S., but you could end up having a case where these goods could end up in China or any other country. So make sure you have that information nice and handy. As I said, this is our generic version. Um, some quite often just signifying the country of origin on the commercial invoice will be su sufficient. Now here is a version that uh, has gone by the wayside a bit for us, but this is an example to show you of our NAFTA certificate of origin, which is now considered, well, expired for new shipments. So any type of certificate of origin that's pertaining to a free trade agreement is going to have a header on it. And that header is going to tell you what countries are responsible to it and which kind of free trade agreement it is. So for those of you which are dealing with uh, our NAFTA countries, you've gotten nice and familiar and, and warm and fuzzy with the USMCA certificate. This is our version of the form as there isn't currently a standardized form for the USMCA. Each of the governments have examples and different freight companies have examples that you can utilize. There are minimum um, criteria which should be on this, on this documentation. But this is a good example of the USMCA one. And there is, of course, other ones out there, our Israeli Free Trade Agreement, uh, the Caribbean Basin, numbers of them where there may be a very specific form which has some elements which vary based on the agreement. 
And always keep in mind, if you're being asked to fill out a certificate of origin for a free trade agreement, that your first responsibility is to vet and make sure that the product actually and the transaction actually qualify for the free trade agreement. You know, I, I myself as an exporter have had many times where the guys in shipping have had information on how to fill out a form, and they've been filling that form out consistently the same way for years, not necessarily being wise to the fact that some of the components may change in their sourcing. And those components changing in their sourcing may change our applicability with the free trade agreement or one of the data elements and how it needs to be completed. So make sure if it's something that is associated directly with a free trade agreement, that the right people are involved in making sure that you're vetting that for that accuracy. Because this is one of those documents too, like our SLI and our invoice that somebody is going to be signing. So when they're signing that, they are attesting to the truth of that information. And Jim, are you back with us? That, you know, when that it's so important that people with knowledge are signing that document. So on to some of the other type of documents that can end up, end up popping up for you. Um, you know, sometimes you're going to get requests for random different documents that could be things such as a pre-shipment inspection certificate. Um, many of you have probably had to deal with things such as um, inspections done on site ahead of time. It's often done in textile areas, in um, food, alcohol, things like that, where they want to make sure that an inspector goes out, looks at the goods, and make sure that they meet the specifications and that they meet certain quality standards. So it can be normal to be requested for something like an inspection certificate. You may be requested for an insurance certificate. If you are shipping under one of the INCO terms with an I in it, there would be express insurance specifically for that shipment and a certificate should be in play. You could also have under another INCO term where somebody asks that you add insurance to the transaction. So if you're having that added by your freight forwarder or directly by your surety, make sure you get a copy of that certificate your evidence that the, that the move is actually insured and for your customer in the event that should be any kind of law. I had mentioned um, CAS's listing on chemicals under description earlier. In that same way, that if you've got an SDS on your product, any type of material um, safety data sheet or any kind of chemical index form, that if you've got that and it's not very easily available particularly, make sure you include a copy of it. If it's a shipment that you do routinely to your customer, make sure that they have a copy so that way their import broker has it should it be requested. You know, it's quite often we ship this stuff overseas and, you know, somebody in, in China or Thailand, well, you know, we're all in, in nighttime here, they're going to have a question. So if they're going to have a question, they've got to wait for you in the United States to come back into the next business day. That's time that is lost. So make sure if there is something like an SDS, that could clear up any questions that you're unavailable to answer, make sure you just include that or even get an email to your customer ahead of time. Uh, Kristen, great point here too. How many times, you know, you're, you don't send enough documentation and then it raises questions. You know, having that safety data sheet or having that insurance certificate is part of the, the export document packet uh, it's going to end confusion. You, you know, you want that information up front. You don't want any delays, especially if they can't get the goods delivered for some reason because they didn't have the safety data sheet. Yeah, there's that term lines down. So, you know, if you're shipping something, particularly air freight, any information you can give your customer to make sure that those questions in the beginning, the who, what, where, when, and why, have been provided is going to set them up for the most potential for getting these goods cleared quickly and effectively. Jim, that brings us to the Canada Customs Invoice. One of my favorite invoices, too. So uh, here's, here's one of the things that I see happen all the time where people say, look at I had to fill out an extra form. Yes, you can fill out a Canada Customs Invoice, but if you know, you you are completing the your commercial invoice and it contains all the data elements that Canada Customs requires, you don't have to fill out this form. 
this will save you key stuff. So um, a lot of times I'll, what I'll do is I'll either help them template, template the commercial invoice, the Canon Customs invoice, in such a way that they could use that and then they can uh, supplement it or we'll work on the commercial invoice and just make sure all the data elements are there. And, and you're going to say, okay, fine. If I wanted to do that, where would I find these data elements? And, and I'd be glad to send you the link, but it's, it's a D-memo on the Canada Customs uh, website, and it's a D1-4-1. And this one, it's been there forever. Um, this will save a lot of time and effort. And so many companies export to Canada, and th this will save some steps and, and extra paperwork. Who wants to fill out an extra form if they don't have to, right? Most definitely, most definitely. <clears throat> and that actually brings us to end user certificates. So the example we're providing here is the one for the from the Department of Commerce being the BIS 711. This is the, the basic um, form that the U.S. government has us used to be able to make sure that we understand the parties to the transaction and the end use. So you may be requesting this from your customer. This form would be specifically uh, required for certain license applications. Or you may be asking this information from your customer in a generic means, asking them to confirm to the end user or the end user of the product. Now, at the same time, you may be receiving that request from other countries, too, that they may have versions that they're looking for. We find in most cases that going back to this form from the U.S. government is the best and most simplistic to make sure that you're relaying the right information and you're respecting and acknowledging the regulations from the United States. So I use this form in many cases where I have a product that may require licensing and I don't know enough about the party yet. And so sales would immediately go out and have them fill out this form. And this was my way to also be able to reflect and make sure that all the parties to the transaction were accurate you know, there have been cases where I would receive this end user certificate prior to the physical exportation, and I would run the parties. I, I'd look at the parties to it and the end use, and I'd, I'd do my screening, and I would do my due diligence. And then, lo and behold, when the packing list came to me to do the commercial invoice, the parties had changed. <laughs> so make sure that you're looking at all of these documents from the beginning to end to make sure that the parties are also staying consistent, right? So, Kristen, a uh, couple questions for you here. Obviously, like, you know, um, I see a lot of new certificates that don't look like this. Do, do they have to use the 7-Eleven form? Well, they don't in all cases. Particularly if something is EAR 99, that information being relayed on letterhead or in an email with a signature is going to be sufficient for you to do your due diligence. If you are in the position where you are looking at a license transaction, this form is your best form to be able to use to make sure that you have all of the elements, as well as that there's certain countries, the government still requires the specific version. So make sure if you're dealing with licensed product that you're up to date on those. And of course, if you have any questions, reach out to somebody such as us or reach out to a freight forwarder for guidance. Okay, thanks. So when it comes other yeah when it comes to other additional documents you know there's all types of them you, you know you have you have documents like the free sales certificate free sales certificate has to do with food and food stuffs so you know you know obviously this is either issued by FDA or state government and it's to indicate that that food product is eligible for export and there's, you know, no unresolved export actions pending on it. Foreign go governments and foreign customers may request this form. Um, same thing with health and sanitary certificates. Uh, you know, just to make sure that they've confirmed that, you know, it meets that sanitary certificate. And then how many times have you seen it, Kristen, where you, you don't have a letter of credit, but you got a time or site draft, right? You know, and, and those, those are documents that you might see as well. 
Um, sometimes you need a doc receipt if you don't if you're doing a letter of credit, and then uh, free trade declarations. I know Kristen, you, you talked about you know some of the various ones. Trade.gov has a lot of resources for this form as well, as U.S. Customs does have a new form that. That, that's out there as well. So those are all great tools uh, to help people. You know, one of the ones that I've seen recently come up is phytosanitary certificates are now be, being demanded by China. And um, so this is something that I think when it comes to other documentation, um, one of the greatest takeaways you can do is email the buyer and say, please confirm besides commercial invoice and uh, bill lading, what other documentation are you going to require? I mean, how many times have, have you seen it where, uh, you know, the shipment gets over there and then they're, they're scrambling saying, uh, we need this document and we need this document. So this would be something that would be really, really important uh, that is confirmed. You know, most definitely, and that's where things such as, you know, checklists come, come into play that if you've got a new customer and you give them a checklist where they provide all the right information about them and their location and you're asking right on there what kind of forms that they may require, it's only going to set you up for success and not to have to frustrate the customer with documents after the fact. I've, um, I've seen times where something such as an inspection certificate would be requested after the fact. Well, for us, in order to have actually done the inspection, that requirement needed to be known prior to the shipment leaving. So very important to make sure that those are known. And sometimes that may be, for those of you as a takeaway, to also talk to your order processing and customer service team to make sure that any type of forms that could be requested on the document, they make sure makes its way over to the logistics and shipping group. So some of our um, common errors that do pop up. Um, first of all, getting that name and address of the buyer and consignee. You may have times where your buyer and your consignee are two different parties. If they are two different parties, list out those two different parties. That may be able to help them with their customs clearance, and it also shows that you've done the due diligence for export controls. Having the INCO terms in place, this confirms again for everybody who is responsible for what and who's, who's associated with which kinds of costs. Now, in that INCO term, some of these ERP systems that people use to generate um, documentation only give them that three-letter code. You do want to make sure if your system limits you to the three-letter code that you continue that either manually on the documentation or in a field that you continue that being that named location. It's so important to make sure that that named location follows that three-letter code. Having that piece count and those weights. Now, from your performa to your actual commercial invoice, something such as the piece count and weight may have changed. Maybe the elements of the order changed. Maybe there was an over and un, un, an overage or an under, if it was something in like a textiles or any kind of weighed kind of type of commodity. So make sure that that information is accurate and up to date. Make sure that description of goods. You know, that there's a good reason for having things such as serial and model numbers but most importantly, making sure that the description of the goods is standard enough that an officer could interpret what, that, what those words mean and from there be able to identify and associate it with the tariff number which was provided and that it makes sense, that it does line up. When we touched on earlier is give that reason for export. You know, th there's various times where goods make their customs in various countries where the terms of what's happening with this shipment may impact the duties and taxes. So when it's something that could be a sale versus a consignment, a loaner versus a lease on a demo unit, on a carnet, a repaired or modified upgraded piece of equipment. You know, in many countries, if you, if you return a piece of equipment and they upgrade it with the latest and greatest um, gadgets and gadgets, when it goes back to that country, they may only have to pay the difference for the upgrade. Maybe when they sent it to you, when they exported it, they had to file documentation with customs to assure when the repaired or upgraded unit came back that they didn't have to pay duties and taxes on it. 
So make sure that you're giving the reason for that export, and that will really help to clear things up and protect your customer on the other side. And here's some more, Jim. You got it. So, you know, obviously, like, you know, another one that we see a lot of times is the things going out temporarily for whatever reason. If that's the case, indicate that it's a temporary um, import into that other country. You know, we're, it's important now that your commercial invoice indicates if it, there's an ECCN or a USML category. Um, a lot of times there's license exceptions that you can use, but you still have to provide the ECCN number for it. Country of origin, Kristen talked about this earlier, where, you know, the country where it's manufactured, not, not where it was bought, is going to be important. Value and currency, we, you know, Canada and U.S., uh, we both use dollars, but there's a big exchange difference. So it's very important to indicate that. If for some reason you have no charge items or samples, Customs wants a representative replacement cost for these items. It's really important that that's shown there. You covered warranty repairs and replacements already. And then we talked about this before, that destination control statement. Make sure that's on there. Make sure that one invoice indicates the true and correct as well. And, you know, don't forget, sign in blue pen, right? This is, this is an important takeaway. Yeah, you know, especially, you know, you're dealing with any of those countries which are really big on picking up on having that original. I actually, Jim, one company I worked at, we made it a rule out on the shipping dock, only blue pens. That way the guys didn't okay. have to think about it, and they knew right away they signed everything in blue, and it was obvious that it was a no charge. I Excuse me, that um, it was an original signature. But on the no charge items, I did want to add that um, I've had cases where I've seen people trying to do a nice thing that there's a shipment going to somebody, um, particularly when it's a distributor, and they want to add in some, some freebie-type things, either, you know, some free mugs or T-shirts, or it might be something like um, a present for a holiday or something. If those items are going to be included in the shipment, you do, as Jim said, you've got to include that information. You know, it, they think they're being nice by throwing something in. I once had a shipment where there was a lot of high-tech equipment, and customers did look at the shipment. And when they went through the shipment, they found a box of laser pointers that were, you know, they had the company's emblem on it that were a gift. Those five little laser pointers ended up holding up that shipment for weeks because also those laser pointers had government requirements in the importing country that they needed to clear with certain indicators. But seeing as it wasn't even on the shipment, not only was it not declared, but now they were um, not going through the appropriate clearance me measurement for these partner agencies which work with customs. So very important to, and, you know, and I'll also say it, that if somebody's going to suggest to you when you're, when you're shipping a shipment out of the product which you manufacture and they want to ship something that's either food or alcohol, very much try to look at doing that shipment either separately, and particularly in the cases of things like alcohol, look for the people who actually hold the right permitting to allow them to do it. Don't allow something that's meant to be a nice gift or a nice extension of, of gratitude turn into delaying a customer shipment and causing them additional um, pains and potentially additional monetary costs. Great, great point, Kristen. You know it, I know. We've seen this happen where all of a sudden that, that shipment's delayed. Um, you know, I, I think last but not least, remember, Always, if you're not sure about the documentation, send it in advance and have that buyer slash importer record sign off that the documents are correct. Because once they do, then you could, if there's a delay and they want changes, then you can go back on and say, you approved this. You know, you, you, know, you, have, sure you have responsibility here. Yep. Especially those, you know, those high-risk countries, you know, we know that Brazil is going to require those originals, and we know that their, their banking system is really diligent on, on looking at the details. It, you've got licenses, letters of credit. Um, Jim and I were talking the other day about those countries that jump out at us, uh, the BRIC nations, the Brazil, Russia, India, China. In those mm -hmm. cases where they may have other things to worry about in their country, 
send the documents the night before if you're able to. Let them review them, especially the first time transaction with that customer. Once you got things down packed, typically they're going to be down packed pretty well. Right, Jim? Yep. <laughs> okay. So that takes through our presentation. And um, I do believe that I did see a couple of questions pop up. Um, does our moderator want to rejoin us for questions? or? Hi, uh, yeah. Like Thank to... you so much. Um, oh. Um, yeah, Kristen and Jim, thank you so much for this informative session. Um, and especially in this, um, in light of this new era of uh, video conferencing, I really thank you for sharing your information um, of now, uh, sharing your knowledge and experience in, in such an engaging format. Um, we're going to now move to the Q&A portion of this webinar. Um, operator. Uh, would you provide the audience instructions on how to ask a question by phone? If you would like to ask a question, press star 1, unmute your line, and speak your name when prompted, as your name is required for your question. If you would like to withdraw your question, press star 2. Again, to ask a question, press star 1. One moment as we wait for questions. Okay, and as we uh, wait for questions, um, we have actually a couple in queue now, um, so I'll go ahead and ask this question. Um, the first one is, what is a good best practice regarding invoice creation or approvals? Kristen, go ahead. Where, you know, that's very much where we say that, you know, the people who have the knowledge of the transaction should be the ones who are generating that invoice. They should be the ones who have the information that came from the customer's order and any confirmations back that confirm your payment terms, the parties to the transaction, et cetera. So somebody who's vested in it. Quite often nowadays, that may be pretty automated through your ERP system. Particularly if it's not automated, you want to make sure that that chain of information is nice and tight. So a guy on the shipping dock who might be completing the documentation has accurate information from the front end of the house who may be processing the order. So it really should be somebody who has the complete knowledge of the transaction. Any additional thoughts, Jim? I, like I said, make sure you send those overseas. Get that sign off, especially if it's going to a place like India or Brazil. The last thing you want to do is get that thing held up in customs because it could be months. Thank you, Kristen and Jim. Operator, are there any uh, uh, questions coming into the line? I'm showing no questions in the queue. Um, as a reminder, to I, ask a question, press star 1. I do see a question in the chat. Um, I do see that somebody did ask that if we could confirm if the country of manufacture is different than the country of origin and what should be shown. So on commercial documents that are asking for country of origin, they are consistently looking for the country of manufacture. So the um, on an SLI, for example, you would actually see that it would say ship in origin or origin point. So country of origin is consistent in meaning country of manufacture. Is that um, pretty safe in your experiences, Jim? Yep. So, you know, just because you bought something in one country doesn't make it made there. And it really has to be determined on, you know, where it was substantially transformed. And, um, so, that, yeah, that's definitely the, the correct view. Great. Um, I think we are at 2.34 right now, um, but we do have a couple of really great questions. Um, maybe I'll ask this last question um, to conclude our talk. Um, but this last question is, what if I'm being asked for a form I haven't seen before? Kristen, you want to take that one? Or? Sure. You know, it always concerns me when a new form pops up. And, you know, it is one of those things, particularly with USMCA. We did um, early on see some different varieties of the form pop up. Um, you may see a different form completely uh, random, new, something that may be looking for language interpretation, or it could be just a form that has um, different elements than you're used to. What I would always do is a couple of things. First, I would take a look at the form and make sure that the data elements they're asking you for are standard elements that you might provide on one of the other commercial documents. 
if the form is something that looks like it's on a government type of letterhead or has information you don't typically provide to your customers or you are not aware of the information, make sure it's brought by the correct people internal to your organization. And if necessary, refer to an outside party, whether it's your uh, customs attorney, freight forwarder, a trade advisor such as Jim or myself. But before you're signing anything that you're not familiar or comfortable with, make sure that you have a second set of eyes look at it. You always want to be comfortable in whatever you're signing. Kristen, one of the ones I see the most on is uh, the uh, parties in the U.S. and they'll get a request from Europe saying, can you complete a declaration saying that your goods qualify for one of the free trade agreements going into Europe? And um, so I usually have to translate this is what they're looking for, this is what this means, and uh, if your goods were produced in the U.S., they're not going to qualify for this free trade agreement. I usually kind of just walk them through. That seems to be the big one right now, uh, but who knows next week, <laughs> you know. Uh, yeah. Great. Um, so I guess... Uh, uh, Jim, Kristen, if you have, uh, if those are your last comments, um, I guess this concludes today's seminar. Um, thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Uh, again, please join us for one of our upcoming seminars on the 21st, the 27th, and the 29th. Um, and on behalf of the Department of Commerce, we welcome you all for, we thank you all for joining us today. And until next time, stay safe and hope to connect with you again. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. Thanks, Kristen. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Jim. Take care. Thank you for your participation at today's conference. You may disconnect at this time. Are we back in the queue?